Thank you, Anna. That was beautiful. Now, please stand and join me in reciting the Congregational Covenant as found in your printed order of service. Love is the doctrine of this congregation. The quest for truth is its sacrament, and service is its prayer. To dwell together in peace, to seek knowledge and freedom, to serve others in community, thus do we covenant with one another. Thank you. Please be seated. Welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Columbia. My name is Richard McLeod, and I am your service leader of the day. Our minister is the Reverend Stephen Robinson, and on those Sundays when Stephen is not in the pulpit, we present a variety of qualified and interesting speakers from this congregation or from recognized members of the community. So you'll have to keep returning to see what exciting things are going to happen next. Unitarian Universalism is a diverse and non-creedal religion. We are a covenantal religion, which means we don't have to believe the same in order to treat each other the same with respect, equity, compassion, and dignity. Our community is based on deeds, not creeds. As Unitarian Universalists, we side with love, embracing all people regardless of age, color, race, socioeconomic status, physical ability, or religious background. We are a welcoming congregation, which means we also embrace LGBTQ individuals. We encourage everyone to wear name tags so that we may know each other better. Board members wear green name tags. Board members, um, would you stand, please, so you can be recognized? And they always welcome your, your comments and your questions. Thank you. Now, at this time, I'd like to recognize any guests or visitors that are with us today. Um, so if you're willing and able, please stand. Stephen's going to come around with the microphone, so wait till he gets there. And if you would share with us uh, your name, where you're from, um, if you have guests with you, or any other brief information you want to say. This is Stephen's morning exercise. Um, we're the Heslops. We're out of Hartsville. And yeah, we've just been exploring um, spiritual options. So we're just here to um, join you today for that. We're here with our two sons. This is Luke. He's four. And Zeke, he's two. And my name is Brian, and this is Alexis. Yeah, Brian, Alexis, welcome. Welcome. This is indeed the place to explore your spiritual options. Other visitors, introducing visitors. Anybody else? Thank you, Stephen. When we are further along in our recovery, um, we will take time to actually stand and greet each other. But until then, just... Um, Wave your welcomes to everybody. And then afterwards, we will, of course, gather in the social hall to where we can have more conversation. But until then, just look forward to it. Our chalice lighter today is Laura Hartwig. She's going to say a few words, and then she's going to light our chalice. Laura. Good morning. Can you hear me OK with my mask on? OK, good. Uh, so like Richard said, I'm Laura Hartwig. I became a UU in 2010 when I found my people. Um, I moved to South Carolina from New York in 2016 and joined UUCC at that time. Um, I come here every week because I feel like I always learn something from the sermon and the people that I talk to here. And I love the UUCC's commitment to social justice. So I come here to make me and the world better at the same time. We light this chalice in the name of Unitarian Universalism, spirit of light, 
and of life come unto us. This morning's opening musical meditation is I'll Bid My Heart Be Still by Rebecca Clark. And we are pleased as always to feature Karen Peters on viola. Thank you, Anna and Karen. Just absolutely beautiful. So many, so many Sundays here. Uh, I feel like the words that I say get in the way of the music that we produce. Um, so just recognize that. Um, you have to listen to me some too, I guess. But our opening words today are entitled, The Church Has Left the Building by Margaret Weiss. And when Margaret Weiss wrote this, she said that you can replace the word church with whatever word is comfortable for you as you uh, hear this in your mind, congregation, fellowship, whatever that is appropriate for the community that you're in. I'm gonna stick with the word church um, for our purposes today. The church is not a place, it is a people. The church is not only a steeple above the tree line, the streets and the cars, rather it's a people proclaiming to the world that we are here for the work of healing and of justice. 
The church is not walls built stone upon stone held together by mortar, but rather person linked with person, linked with person, all ages, genders, and abilities, a community built on the foundation of reason, faith, and love. The church is not just a set of doors open on Sunday morning, but the commitment day after day and moment after moment of our hearts creaking open the doors of welcome to the possibility of new experience and radical welcome. The church is not simply a building, a steeple, a pew. The church is the gathering together of all the people and experiences and fear and love and hope in our resilient hearts, gathering however we can to say to the world, welcome, come in, lay down your heartache and pick up your hope and love. For the church is us, each and every one of us together, a beacon of hope to this world that so sorely needs it. This time we have a moment in our service where we create a time for concerns and joys to be shared in community and to light candles. If you would like to light a candle, there are um, typically seven candles on the table out front. You can grab one on the way in uh, and share a joy or concern. Uh, we invite you to come up to the front, front and briefly do that, speak into the microphone so that you can be heard. Just a reminder that we are um, streaming on video as well. If you are streaming on video and watching uh, and would like to have a joy or concern shared and a candle lit during this part of the service, please don't hesitate to email us, uh, Andrea or myself, and we will make sure that that candle is read during the service. At this time, I invite you to come up front. Good morning. My name is Bethany, and I always usually try to do a joy and a concern when I come up here. My concern is that I have tried to have the conversation with some people that are important to me um, about what they're doing when they start complaining about how the earth is warming and climate change. I say, well, what are you doing to make a change, to make it better? And like they come up with blanks. And I'm like, well, what about giving up those disposable water bottles or those disposable one-time use plastic bags or straws? And oh my God, I'm just so frustrated that they won't make one small change. And if I'm talking to any of you, just please make one small change because the world is not disposable. So that's my concern and my joy is that I see a number of uh, you, you young adults here, and uh, that makes me really happy. So um, I do have snacks for our young adults, so <laughs> come see me at the end of service. <laughs> Thank you. Hello, my name is Linda Brennison, and I'd like to light this candle today for all the public school teachers and public school children in South Carolina. This past week was the um, first week of school for many, and it doesn't look good. I especially light the candle for those who were forced to go back without mask, and for my daughter, who is a public school teacher in a field of special education where many of the students are unable due to their disabilities to wear a mask. And it's middle school, so some of them are not old enough for a vaccination. It's a serious situation and I light a candle for all of those people. Good morning, my name is Pat Moore and I would like to light a candle of remembrance. 
you may think this is redundant because I can't, actually some flowers were donated for her last Sunday. But I want you to make, I want to make sure you don't forget this long-term memory, or, uh, this long-term member, I'm sorry. Um, her name is, is Timmy Barrington, and she passed away on August 10th. Her husband, Mel Barrington, is still a member here. You may have seen him sitting in the middle. Um, Mel was a member of this congregation for 50 years. She is responsible. She found the church in Olympia that we were in earlier. A lot of you may not have ever met her because she was mostly active working back with the kids. And she survived by Mel and her, her daughter, Robin. So don't forget. to light a candle for a, f a good friend and a, and a very good friend of, of our congregation. That's Ann Cargill. She's uh, having to undergo some tests to determine uh, how she can, uh, they can <clears throat> deal with her, her issue and uh, just keep her in, in your thoughts and prayers and, and especially for her mate. Uh, uh, Good old, what's his name? Uh, Ken uh, White. Yeah. Sorry. Thank you. I'm Mary McLaughlin, and I have a virtual candle. I came in late uh, to light for Ruth Ann Fox Hines, who died a week ago Friday. She was a mentor and friend to me and a longtime psychologist and worked at the USC Counseling Center. Brandy Mims asked that we light a candle for her and her family. Uh, her mother, Barbara, died on August 17th. And then many of you know our church administrator, Andrea, is in Florida with her sister, who is very ill. Uh, and so I light a candle for Andrea and her sister and her family as they, uh, she provides care. Mary, I got your candle here. And I light one final candle for all those things that we are holding silently and close in our hearts today, both joys and concerns um, that are shared in this community through silence. One of the beautiful images I like to think about with emotions is Rumi's poem about the guest house, which describes emotions as guests that you welcome into your house. And I think about that every time I stand here during Candles of Community, that this is an opportunity to take everything that you've heard and welcome it in, because it's teaching us something, informing us of something, connecting us to others in our community. So in this moment of silence, invite all those guests into your house.
Thank you. As we prepare for our offering this morning, this is a reminder, uh, Mackenzie is standing in the back. If you want to wave, Mackenzie, for any uh, children or adults that would prefer to go there for playtime uh, instead of being in here in the sanctuary. Um, but she is definitely, I'm guessing, creating an inside experience today based on what I'm hearing behind us with the rain coming. As we prepare for our offering, uh, a reminder as well that half of our cash collection uh, in the month of August goes to the Palmetto Place Children and Youth Services. We will have a guest next Sunday uh, come and share more information about this great work that they are doing in the community. If you would like to contribute, you can put share the plate on a check or on an envelope, or you can also donate online. At this time, I invite our ushers to come and receive our morning offering. Our offertory music is When Our Heart is in a Holy Place by Joyce Pulley. Receive these good gifts, symbol of our generosity and our commitment to the good work of the UUCC. Leonardo da Vinci told a story, and he didn't tell a whole lot of personal stories in his writings, and so we must take notice when he does share a personal story. Many of you probably know the story uh, that Da Vinci tells of wandering into a dark cave on one of his days when he was traveling. Um, there are lots of theories around what happened in the dark cave. One of my favorites is that he encountered an alien civilization in the dark cave, and therefore uh, some of his drawings and sketches of human beings uh, looking a little bit oblong in the head is from that encounter um, instead of da Vinci probably painting people the way he saw them in his own imagination. However, um, and if that is your theory, I'm not discounting it. Um, certainly, um, you're welcome to maintain that. But however, whatever he encountered in the dark cave, he didn't share, but he did describe the experience of standing outside the cave and getting ready to walk into it and he writes in his own words, having wandered some distance among gloomy rocks, I came to the mouth of a great cave in front of which I stood for some time astonished. Bending back and forth, I tried to see whether I could discover anything inside, but the darkness within prevented that. And suddenly there arose in me two contrary emotions, fear and desire, fear of the threatening dark cave and desire to see whether there were any marvelous things within. Desire one. I think about these two emotions 
as we are wandering out of our own caves of pandemic and experiencing the fear of what it's like to somehow reintegrate back into culture, a culture that has been locked away for so long, taking so much of our life and so many of the lives of so many in our culture. How we approach life going forward must involve these two emotions, fear and desire. Fear's been a part of our culture anyway. We are so many things that we are afraid of. My mom taught me to be afraid of everything outside because she was afraid of everything outside. So I think about all the things that I grew up afraid of as a child. And I used to think that was so unrealistic to be afraid of everything. She would say, be afraid of the grass, it'll make you itchy. Be afraid of the road, the cars will run over you. Be afraid of the trees. If you climb them, you may fall out of them and be afraid of them. If you stand under them, lightning might strike. <laughs> and so as I have lived life and that sense of paranoia, I am very well aware of my relationship with fear and what can, we can be afraid of. And having kids of my own, I have to admit, there's a lot of fear of knowing all the things that can happen. Uh, just as uh, Linda talked about um, going back to school, it's been a week of fear of knowing all the things that could possibly happen as we send our kids into, as we talked about a couple of weeks ago, what is a safe environment and what that means. Fear is very much a way that we navigate our culture, not just because of the pandemic, but because of so many acts of violence and things that we encounter, so many things that could happen, and Hollywood loves to play on those fears and glamorize them in a way of reminding us of all the things that can happen. Politicians play on those fears, and it's not unfounded. We, there are things that we truly should be afraid of. Last weekend, uh, the governor signed into law House Bill 3094, which is an open carry law for the state of South Carolina. So knowing that as you walk around in our gun-obsessed culture in Columbia, South Carolina, that there are lots more of them out there uh, now that we are aware of more to be seen. And maybe that's a good thing that you know uh, who has what as we're walking around. But our obsession with guns and how that can play out in our culture and the violence that can happen on any given day, in any given scenario, any given situation where you find yourself creates a tremendous amount of fear. And who among us don't walk into public places, gas stations, malls, theaters, maybe even this congregation, this building, without some thought at some point of what happened, what would we do if that happened here? That is not an unrealistic thing to think about, but it does create a tremendous amount of fear. So as we w navigate the unknown and do our work in community, there is no way to completely be safe as we do it. And so fear is definitely an emotion that we have to encounter while we navigate our culture, but we also have a deep desire and passion and sense of calling to connect to the community, to provide care for those in our community. And it is our goal here at the UUCC that desire and passion wins, that we somehow figure out how to navigate our fear, whether it's the fear of the things that can go wrong or just our fear of being introverted and meeting new people and putting ourselves out there. Whatever fear we are overcoming, it is our goal at the UUCC, looking outside the walls of this congregation, that desire and passion wins in our community. And we have an opportunity to define what community is here at the UUCC. There are some very narrow definitions of community. Community is people that come together with certain ideas or drawn together with certain uh, geographical areas or characteristics as a community or things that we believe. We have an opportunity to expand and redefine 
what community is. There's a story about Jesus when he was uh, just talking about community and talking about loving your neighbor. He was asked the question, what is neighbor? What is community to you? And I think Jesus um, looked it up. He had a Merriam-Webster dictionary that he carried around with him. Is that the right one, Don? That... <laughs> Okay, an Oxford English dictionary that Jesus carried around with him. And he looked up community and said, well, it's people with all the same ideas and connected together in characteristics in a geographical area. And so that's who your neighbor is. No, he didn't. He looked into his heart, into his spiritual eyes, and he described a story of a man reaching across cultural lines and divisions and taboos to provide care and love for someone who is hurting. Think about that. In describing community and neighbor and who that is, Jesus intentionally stepped across the lines that we sometimes draw, these imaginary lines. I think the powerful lesson in that for you and me is to look outside the lines that we typically draw for ourselves, that this is our community, these are the people that we are being uh, in relationship with, that we are comfortable being in relationship with in this little circle, and to call ourselves or feel called by our love and our desire, overcoming our fear, and step across those lines and expand what it means to be community. Who is it in Columbia, in our greater city in our state of South Carolina, who are those who are hurting that we may have to cross lines that we have defined as community? We may have to overcome fears to connect to that greater community, to be people of care, people of social justice, people of action. Are we willing to constantly move beyond those lines and push against the boundaries of our own comfort zones to meet those who we are connected to? who are connected to us, who we need to feel connected to in love and in care. We have great opportunity to redefine community on the global stage today. Are we in community with Afghanistan? Are we? I don't know the answer to that question. I'm just asking questions today. <laughs> I don't know the answer to these complex questions, but that is a question that we have to wrestle with. Are we in community with a place that we've been in war with for 20 years? Can we at least recognize that warfare does not create community? If nothing else, learn that lesson. Are we in community with the people of Haiti who have had disaster after disaster and now are experiencing the loss of life and property and way of life during this earthquake? Can we draw outside the line of our normal sense of comfort and decide this is what community is? Can we decide that the borders that border our country, they may have ways they protect us legally, but they don't get to define for us what community is? Can we embrace those as community, those individuals. You and I have a great opportunity uh, in the work that is ahead of us to stand outside the opportunities in our community to give in to fear or to give in to desire and passion, to give in to our call to social justice, to love, to care. We have an opportunity to choose who our community is. As you use, we've always had a deep commitment to care for the world outside the walls of the local congregation, as Margaret Weiss's opening words reminded us. And now at the UUCC, we have a great opportunity to strengthen that resolve, to move outside the walls when it's not raining, it's a little sunnier outside to move outside the walls of this building and decide this is what community ministry looks like. Many of you know the Reverend Dr. Pippin Whitaker, who is a lifelong UU and been a member of the UUCC for a decade. 
Some of you may remember when she and her husband, Steve, first joined the uh, congregation. They have th three children, Alexi, Kepler, and Owenna. Reverend Pippin's parents, Keitha and Bob Whitaker, who we know uh, so well and love. When she first came here, Pippin was a member of the faculty of the University of South Carolina in the social work department and felt a call to community ministry and started seminary in Meadville, Lombard, in Chicago. You can read a little bit more in the bio um, about Pippin and her work over the past few years. I want to bring us to the very present and say that we have a great opportunity as a congregation to build an official affiliation relationship with Pippin, who is a community minister. And so this is a great day for us as a congregation, an opportunity for us to bless our relationship uh, going forward with the work that Pippin is doing in the community. Since 1991, the UUA has formally recognized community ministers as eligible for fellowship with the association and requires that those ministers that are doing community ministry be in relationship and affiliated with a local congregation and both benefit from that relationship. As we were talking about this in board meetings uh, and thinking about what this means for us going forward and having a relationship uh, with Pippin as an affiliated minister and the community ministry she's doing, the thing that constantly came up is, what is in this for us besides benefit? <laughs> what is it? And we, we looked at it in so many different ways. Ultimately, for the UUCC, this is an opportunity for us to increase the broader ministry and our social commitment uh, and help connect and collaborate with so many others. We are so fortunate here to have Pippin, who has made her way back to Columbia, South Carolina for so many different reasons um, in her own personal life, who has a long history here. Uh, we have an opportunity to affiliate with the UUCC and Pippin to do this great work. So as we redefine what community is in our culture, we get to redefine what it looks like for the UUCC in a strong, firm relationship. And so I'm, I'm pleased to announce that the board, the board voted unanimously to approve an affiliation agreement uh, with Pippin as a community minister. Now, some of you maybe are kind of hearing this for the first time, and we recognize that. And this is an opportunity today as we are thinking about community to explain a little bit about the work that Pippin will be doing and how that will strengthen our social action committee and so many um, arms of reaching out from the UUCC. So today is a day of celebration, a day of blessing, and we have a ritual of blessing prepared just for that, and we are gonna have an opportunity for Pippin to share a little bit about the ministry and the work of community. As the board voted unanimously, our board president's gonna come and share a little bit about this great work and move us into our ritual of blessing. And I'm taking off my mask because my glasses are fogging up. You know, the mission of the UUCC is to nurture and respect each other in our spiritual growth and pursuit of meaning and to create a welcoming and engaging environment through which we work for positive change in the community and the world. Now, in our parish setting, which is like right here in this building, we focus our mission inwardly, developing the community and the bonds and our abilities and through serving, through this, we serve the wider world. Community ministry, however, serves not just a parish, but the ministry in the wider community in the world. And each of us in different ways plays an active part in this larger ministry. Today, our congregation installs as our community minister someone who dedicates her energies to ministry beyond our congregational walls the Reverend Dr. Pippin Whitaker.
Thank you so much, Pat. Thank you, Rep. Steven. When I was about six years old, I was coloring with my best friend in a coloring book, and I just went outside the lines. I was making hair on a horse, and she was really unhappy with this. You're outside the line, she said, and I said, we, you don't have to stay in the lines. You know, if you're holding the crayon, you can go wherever you want. So I guess I'm still coloring outside the lines. <laughs> I am so excited to have the opportunity to share this community ministry with my beloved congregation, UU Congregation of Columbia. This means a lot to me. My ministry vision is to weave justice into the social fabric out there beyond our walls to put seeds, to put healing relationships out there in the fabric of our community. I'll do this in two main areas right now. One is I'm just beginning with a, another minister and another UU to imagine the possibilities of a state action network, a UU state action network, which would help coordinate and connect social justice activities around the state, building relationships among UUs and local communities to build these relationships and also accountability and more meaning. I also work directly with organizations, organizations who often experience their problems as, well, our staff are burned out, overworked. We don't have enough funding. We don't know how to volunteer. We don't have enough volunteers. Perhaps you've heard of this problem. Not enough volunteers to carry forth some great program. And intractable social problems in a world that's really hurting, what could we possibly do? I work with these organizations to find their seeds of power in this deeply relational work to help overcome organizational despair and understand how they can, in each relationship, find liberation and build justice. How can a relationship among staff with a community member build liberation and that way build a resilient, radical hope? That's my calling. And I get to share this with you. You and I together serve a powerful mission in this community and each out in the world. I know many of you are doing so much within the Social Action Committee and beyond every single one of you. I know that you do a lot. And together we get to serve our mission in the wider community. As you seek through your mission of the church to nurture and respect one another and create the environment through which we all work to serve justice, I seek to weave that sense of respect and justice in the community Together, our visions are amplified. I am so grateful to get to share this ministry with all of you. Thank you. I'm gonna ask Pat and Pippin to join me together and we'll have in the unigram and uh, E-Blast coming up, more information about uh, what it means uh, to have an affiliated community minister. I don't think this is the first. Pat shared about 20 years ago that there was a community minister uh, at the UUC that was affiliated. But what that looks like and how that strengthens our congregation. So we look forward to uh, evolving that and growing and informing uh, of this great relationship as we do the work of community. So Pat's going to lead us as our board president. Okay. As president of the Board of Trustees, I now ask all members of the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Columbia to rise, embody our spirit, and join with me in coveting with Pippin. And you'll find the words in your order of service. If you'll join me, we pledge to support and encourage you in our teaching ministry. We are grateful for your social justice ministry to the community and proud of the work you do. I am grateful for your support and promise to serve faithfully 
as the community minister of the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Columbia, bringing our values into the world. So do you welcome the Reverend Dr. Pippin Whitaker as the community minister of the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Columbia? Thank you, you may be seated. offer us a prayer. This is adapted by, from a prayer of installation by the Reverend Sheldon Bennett. Infinite and transforming compassion, universal spirit of love, that which calls us into being, source and sustainer of our lives, that sense of ultimate meaning and compassion that draws us out of our lives and into a community together to minister to one another and to the world. Whatever that source is for you that draws you here, we come together in thanksgiving and celebration today. As members of this congregation, we are grateful for that mystery that has brought us together. We give thanks for the opportunity of the ministries of this church we are grateful for this church home. We're grateful for this partnership in ministry and we are grateful together for the mysterious journey ahead. May this community find joy in this affiliation. May their light for justice and compassion shine even more brightly through this ministry. Great Spirit, May every blessing be upon this congregation as together we strive and live into the covenant of our being. Give us all to hold fast to the promise of our mutual ministries as laity, as teachers, as parish minister, as community minister, that the living, loving spirit of this community shall be amplified and joyful. May we rejoice that the living power of this spirit that we all feel, however we name it and imagine it, let it flow forth as a mighty stream in our lives. May we enjoy this journey together. Blessed be and amen. amen. With lightness and joy, our closing music is Mozart's Laudate Dominum.
Thank you, Anna and Karen, again, for providing such beautiful music. So as we look outside the walls, windows, doors of this church and see the so many people in our culture who are crying out for help, who are looking to us to be a beacon of hope, a place of caring and love and support, may we overcome our fears, our hesitations, and let desire and passion win. So as we extinguish our chalice today, may it only ignite the fires to do our good work, for we are the UUCC. This concludes our service. If you will, make your way out for very wet social time out there. Uh, we call it the UUC Splash Park today, so if you'd like to enjoy it. Thanks for being here.